It's Juvenis. Ladies and gentlemen, keep watching Juvenis TV and then keep subscribing, keep following them at Juvent Juvenis TV, ladies and gentlemen. Jim Boy says so. Yeah. Yeah. so much, the nominee on the podium is uh, Mr. Festus Keamo. SAN nominee from Delta State Mr. Kiamo on behalf of my distinguished colleagues I want to welcome you to the Senate Chamber we already have copies of your CV and as the tradition here is you can highlight those things in the CV that you think the Senate should particularly take note of. And in addition, you could also mention those things that are not in the CV but you feel are important and significant for this exercise. Once again, on behalf of my colleagues, you are welcome to the screening exercise and you can address the Senate now. Your Excellency, the President of the Senate, sitting here as the Chairman of the Committee of the whole Senate, the Deputy Senate President, my Senator, who is my Senator representing me in the Delta Central Senatorial District of Barisi, Obi Omagege all principal officers of this great senate my senators from my states great gentlemen that i know distinguished senator peter womboshi and distinguished senator james manager and all distinguished senators thank you so much for giving me this opportunity My name is Festus Egwarewa Adeniyi Keyamo. My father is from Delta State and my mother is from Ogun State. So I have a pan Nigerian view. I want to first of all give God all the glory. Give God all the adoration and all the praise for making, me, make, making it possible for me to stand before you here today. The fact that I'm standing before you here today, if I look at my antecedent and my past and my upbringing, can only be the work of God and not the work of man. And it is God using President Muhammadu Buhari as a pencil in his hands to make it possible for me to be here today. And I give God all the glory for that. Distinguished Senators, the story of my life, since I left university about two and a half decades ago, and I was called to the bar, and I'm sure as you all know, has been one that has been totally dedicated to the crusade for social justice using the instrumentality of the law. I have used the instrumentality of the law at all stages of my life to fight for social justice, to fight for human rights, to fight for accountable governments, and to promote and entrench democracy. And about 10 years ago, I took this further by even accepting to serve as a lead prosecutor to the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. And in that role, I have prosecuted so many high-profile individuals in courts. And so I've been an active prosecutor 
and a general practitioner of law all these years. In that role as a prosecutor, I have won some of my cases, like all lawyers. I have lost, lost some of my cases, like all lawyers, and many of them are still in court and on appeal. It is also that passion to entrench democracy that made me some years ago, I went to court to enforce the powers of this National Assembly on my own volition, on my own expense. I fought for this National Assembly in respect of the appointment of service chiefs on my own. I continuously drew the attention of this Senate and the House of Representatives to their powers regarding the appointment of service chiefs and they needed, that they needed the, the president needed the concurrence of this house. And when I was not, when they didn't listen to me, I went to court. And in a landmark judgment, I won the case where the court said service chiefs must come and bow before this house before they can be appointed. And after that judgment, all the service chiefs were sacked, new service chiefs were appointed, and since that judgment, all service chiefs have been coming to the National Assembly to get their approval. That is the kind of passion I've had to fight, even for the National Assembly. The passion for human rights have also led me to defend across the country, irrespective of tribe and religion, students who have been detained illegally, civil rights activists, journalists, social crusaders across the country, free of charge. All of this free of charge. And I know many of them listening to me across the country can testify to this. And even though I don't believe in a separatist agenda in this country, I don't believe, but that passion for human rights have also led me to even defend separatist leaders. Apart from their vision, their crusade for separatism, I defended them in respect of their human rights alone. Separate leaders for even, you know, in respect of organizations like MASOB, like the Biafran Independent Movement, like the Niger Delta People's Volunteer Force, like the MOSOP, many of the separatists, and I got most of them out of detention, free of charge. That has been my passion for human rights, using the instrumentality of the law. And because of all of this, like you see in my CV, it earned me the Global Award of Human Rights in 2007 by the United States Global Institute, a Global Leadership Council in Washington in 2017. I was conferred with the Global Human Rights Award. I've had the rare privilege to have been brought up and mentored by two or perhaps the strongest characters in this country. And I'm perhaps the only person who have had that privilege. Two of the strongest characters in terms of anti-corruption and human rights. And that is Chief Ganifawa Emi, who brought me up, like you see in my CV. And of course, President Muhammad Buhari right now. I am the only person who enjoys that privilege. Two of the strongest characters in this country have mentored me. And so, in the posture of, of, of all of this, I have asked so many questions of governments in the past. I have asked governments as to how our monies have been used or misused. How public monies have been spent or misspent. And how public monies have been appropriated, appropriated or misappropriated. But I discovered that there's only so much you can do as a private individual. I discovered that. I didn't get answers. And then, it was then I took a conscious decision some years ago to be part of a political process that could get us into power. I took a conscious decision. Because that conscious decision I took was because I discovered that what you can scream, what you can be screaming on the outside for 10 years to achieve, because you, have, you are brimming with ideas, you are brimming with all kinds of solutions to our problems on the outside, and you can be screaming for 10 years, you can only achieve, you can achieve that in 10 minutes 
when you are part of government and part of a political process. Because, you see, it is a natural inclination of governments all over the world to see critics on the outside as enemies. So they, do, they take your views with a pinch of salt. They see opposition as, it's natural all over the world, as, as enemies. So I took that conscious decision to be part of a political process. And that was, that was during the formation of the All Progressive Congress, the APC. And I joined the APC in Delta State. I was a foundation member of the APC in Delta State. The first major meeting held in Delta State involving the national leaders that came to Delta State because we didn't have a government. Delta is a, was a, it's a PDP state. And we didn't have a government. That meeting was held in my house, in a room, in my parlor. And so I can say that the APC was formed in my house in Delta State. It's not a surprise I'm standing here today as a nominee of the APC from that state. It was formed in my house, the APC. And so I discovered that you can, you can change your methodology in the fight for the rights of the people by being part of the process. You can change your methodology without changing your basic principles and your essence as a person. You can. You can do that. And so, that is why I decided to serve, to accept to serve. Despite all I have said and all my antecedents, I've decided to serve. I've decided to be part of the process. And with your kind permission, your kind consideration, if you do approve me, I want to be part of the process and I think I have a lot to prove and I want to make a change. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Nous sommes le sénateur Michael Ope et Miba Midele. Thank you, Mr. President, sitting in the chair. Mr. President, distinguished colleagues, I am Michael Okoyemi Bamidele, representing the Ekiti Central Senatorial District. Are there nominees? I begin by congratulating you as a Nigerian citizen because you have a reputation that precedes you. And for those of us who are familiar with your antecedents, and for somebody like me, who can describe himself, as a matter of fact, as a product of the same struggle with you, struggle of Nigerian students over the years, struggle of Nigerian youth, struggle of the civil society, and partly the creation of the Nigerian media. I am happy to be a part of this process. I have two questions for you. God, through the Senate, and ultimately through Mr. President, granting you the opportunity to serve in the Federal Cabinet of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Would the first thing that will stare you on the face is that being a public administrator is far so different from being an activist. In other words, Mr. Nominee, how would you be able to handle that delicate balancing that the poor will continue to find their voice in you, the civil society, the less privileged will continue to find their voice in you, and even the rich and wealthy will have to find their voice in you as a public servant? And suddenly it dawns on you that internally generated revenue trickles in a little at a time. And many of those things that we would have wished as a civil I mean, activist to be done as soon as yesterday cannot be done. So how will you balance the two? That you don't lose the administration of your admirers and at the same time you are able to discharge the responsibilities bestowed on you as a public servant based on the realities of governance. And secondly, I would like you, again, in a nutshell, to tell this Senate, and of course Nigerians, who I'm sure are also listening to you, your philosophy of life, and how you believe this will be brought to bear to be a strong addition to the performing team of President Buhari. It's important that we hear you out on this. Mr. President, I thank you again for the opportunity. The DSP.
Thank you, Mr. President. Uvi Omo Agege. I represent Delta Central Central District. Mr. President, first, like I did earlier on today, I'd like to extend my heartfelt appreciation to Mr. President for this great nomination. I also want to extend my congratulations to my brother in nominee, my constituent. Mr. President, Senator James Manager will speak for my caucus. But before he does that, as a senator representing my thought I should put in a few words. I rise today, Mr. President, as the first defense witness to corroborate everything he has told the Senate today. Mr. President, this is one nomination that will add value to the Federal Executive Council, headed by Mr. President. Mr. President, I know Festus Kayamo is a very decent man. He is the great ambassador of my people, the Robo Nation, that I have the privilege to represent here. He is also a great ambassador for my state. Mr. President, in his practice of law, he has left his imprints, footprints, in the sounds of time. There is no area of the law where you will not see Kiyamo's landmark uh, contributions. Yes. But I will say that, Mr. President, I just have uh, a couple of questions for him. Or do I call them concerns? For want of a better expression. Mr. Kiyamo, as a lawyer of so many years and a senior advocate of Nigeria, you've traversed most of our courts, the high courts of the state, the federal high court, the court of appeal, and indeed the Supreme Court. You know, for want of a better expression, you know where the bodies are buried. I want to ask you, what major reforms would you want to see in the justice sector, having practiced for so many years? Then number two, we've had so many issues, so many concerns expressed by well many Nigerians about the saturation of uh, the ballot paper with so many political parties, mushroom political parties that ordinarily should not even exist. But because of the provisions of Section 222 of the Constitution, to the extent that INEC adjudges you to have made the requirements for registration of political party, you are registered and placed on the ballot. For those of us who watched the, uh, who participated in these last uh, uh, general elections, I think about 74 or there about political parties participated in the elections, and were all listed in the ballot papers. The game now is to struggle to have your name begin with uh, A A A or something, so you can be at the very top because it becomes easy for you to to ah. With your apologies, I thought. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, uh, Senator Richards was here. You know, there's now a battle, a running battle to, to have. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> to have your name right there eh, at the very top of the ballot. 
So that's the only way you can pretty much stand out, you know, in the midst of uh, 70 to 80 political parties. People are not happy about this. When you go, some people have made the argument that INEC, pursuant to provisions of the Electoral Act, have the power to deregister political parties who do not otherwise uh, perform well in the elections. But some of us, we think otherwise because of uh, the provisions of the Section 222 of the Constitution. Uh, that may require some constitutional amendment. I'd like you to share your thoughts on this as a good and versatile legal petitioner. Uh, with this, uh, Mr. President and my colleagues, I'm not going to say you should take a bar and go. I won't do that. It's a good product. But in, in, the, in the event you decide to extend that courtesy, I will also welcome it. Thank you very much. Senator. Ama Michael Nachi, then the Senate Minority Leader, and uh, Senator Dino Melai. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, distinguished colleagues. My name is Nachi Michael Ama, representing the people of Ebony South. Mr. Kiyamo San, looking at your CV, I discovered that you were a board member of NDIC. And that is correct? Yes. And then, looking at NDIC and the purpose in which it was established, and knowing your character, being a fighter for the masses, I just want to ask, the last time Nigeria banks became distressed was 2003. But up to date, Barista Kiyamo, a lot of customers that deposited their money in these banks have not received back their money. And it does appear that NDIC is now in comatose. Why since 2018 you were there? As a person we know too well, these people are still being old, and NDIC has gone into comatose. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, sitting as the chair. My good friend, Festus Kayam, he knows he's my friend. We have done some battles together. And I'm very, very uh, reassured by the words of the Deputy Senate President that says that you're a good product and we can ask you any question. Which means that you know the law inside out. The Constitution in the fifth schedule, section 11, defines the duties of the code of conduct of public officers. Yet, yet, there is a committee going around usurping the functions of the Code of Conduct Bureau called the Oblak Committee, the uh, Presidential uh, Committee on Asset Recovery. Tell us and tell Nigerians, as a promoter and a defender of the law that you have said, why you have not defended all these people that mean illegally asked by a committee to come and give asset accounts or uh, whatever to them because that committee is not in this constitution and I know you will do justice to this. Senator Dino Malai. Mr. President, my very respected colleagues, Dino Melaye Kogi West. 
I want to start by congratulating my party and friend, <laughs> Festus Keamo. And our relationship actually dates some years back, not recent. I just want to start by saluting your intellectual sagacity. And from your CV, you've practiced law in and out. And these practices have been so recognized by awarding you the highest title any lawyer can end in this country, the senior advocate of Nigeria. And you have been a prosecutor with the EFCC for so many years. So I want to quote section 174 of the Constitution and then ask my question in that regard. Section 150 talks about who is qualified to be the Attorney General of the Federation and the Minister of Justice. Section 174, with the permission of the Chair, I read. 174 says the Attorney General of the Federation shall have powers to any person, to bring any person, sorry, before the Court of Law in Nigeria or other than a court martial in respect of, of offenses created by or under the Act of this National Assembly to take over and continue any such criminal proceedings that may have been instituted by any other authority persons or persons, and to discontinue at any stage before judgment is delivered by any such criminal proceeding instituted undertaken by him or any other person. That is what we call the power of nolly prosecute. prosecute. But that power, Mr. President or Mr. Chairman, and my respected colleagues can only be exercised conditionally. So the Constitution in two gave those conditions that must be met before those powers can be exercised. And it read does. The power conferred upon the Attorney General of the Federation under subsection one of this section may be exercised by him in person or through officers of his department. In exercising his powers under this section, the Attorney General of the Federation shall have regard to three things. One, public interest. Two, the interest of justice. And three, the need to abuse, sorry, the need to prevent abuse of legal process. I want to ask you, as a qualified lawyer, and a man who is even qualified for the office of the Attorney General of the Federation, but I'll venture the, minister, the President send you to the Ministry of Justice with all your area of experiences. Do you think in the last four years the powers of the Attorney General to grant nolly prosecute have met these three conditions? One, that of public interest. Two, the interest of justice. And three, the need to prevent abuse of legal process. Litany of nolly prosecutors have been granted, but I want to ask you, using your celestial mind as an activist, to respond to this question. And secondly, I just want to say that as a versatile minister, I know you to be intellectually mobile. You recite the second stanza of the national anthem. Thank you. That, that is not a question. That is not a question. So you have asked about two questions. Sorry, sorry, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman. This, uh, the Dino, that is not a question. No, it's okay. That that is not that is not a question. You have asked you have asked very very direct questions, so you can disregard the, the letter part. You can respond to the questions, please. Thank you. Thank you, um, 
the President of the Senate. Let me start with Because of the constraint of time, perhaps, what that we will run into, let me start with the question asked by distinguished Senator Ovie Omoagege. The first question was the major reforms that I would like to see in the justice sector. We all agree that our justice sector has been beset by so many problems. And so I think we, we don't doubt that at all. But then, let me say that I'll be prepared to serve in any capacity that the president wants me to serve. But if I'm AGF, I have I have what the idea I, ha I call the three Ds that would be at the heart of judicial reforms. The three Ds. And the first D is the decongestion of the Supreme Court. The second one will be the decongestion of the prisons. And the third one will be the decongestion of cost lists in courts across the country. And that is, cost, of course, uh, linked directly to speedy trials. Now, as to the decongestion of the Supreme Court, I would not occupy the office of AGF for four years without unbundling the Supreme Court. That would be my first task, to unbundle the Supreme Court. Our Supreme Court is the busiest Supreme Court in the world. And it's just not acceptable. The kinds of cases that go up to our Supreme Court are scandalous. Interlocutory appeals. Appeals dealing with, you know, frivolous matters. And I think this country is big enough now to have six regional Supreme Courts where appeals coming from those regions would end there in land matters, contract matters, marriage, and all of that. I mean, as the Supreme Court is designed today, you won't believe, distinguished senators, that a, a, a case of assault, I slap you, you slap me, will go up to the Supreme Court and be lining up with constitutional matters and political matters to be heard. That is scandalous. And that is why today, the cases at the Supreme Court are pending there for the last 15, 10 to 15 years. Justice delayed is justice denied. The diary of the Supreme Court I speak with you now is filled up to 2022. You cannot get a date at the Supreme Court now till 2022. Yes, now, except political cases. And the political cases are compounding the issues again. So, I don't know why it has not been possible to simply establish regional Supreme Courts. And so, the Supreme Court in Abuja would only, would only entertain constitutional matters, political matters, and election disputes. Matters that have to do with that have to do with the interpretation of the Constitution because at that point you need the Central Supreme Court to guide the entire Supreme Court across the country. And even at that point, in matters of constitutional interpretation, distinguished senators, it is scandalous also for a Supreme Court that has 21 justices, for seven of them to sit, to bind others, because the Supreme Court, by the principles of stare decisis, is bound by its own decisions. So if you have a constitutional matter going to the Supreme Court now, seven justices sit, four can overrule three. So you have four justices giving their opinion on a very serious matter, binding 17 others who have, who have no, no opportunity to contribute to that judgment. And tomorrow, if those 17 others come, or part of those 17 others, and they want to determine that same matter, they will be bound by that decision, even if they have a separate view about it. It's scandalous. So there's something wrong about that system. In constitutional matters, I would press for constitutional amendment to make all the 21 justice seats. Because that's our ground norm. The constitution is our ground norm. So four people cannot determine our ground norm. Where 21 are there. And then we're all bound by that. These are things that are wrong with our Supreme Court. So I will, I will, I will make a holistic unbundling of the Supreme Court and complete restructuring of the Supreme Court. Again, 
they have very scandalous applications. You see, there are, are things we borrowed from Britain that are still bogging us down in terms of delay of cases. For example, the provision in the constitution of leave to appeal. It is there in the constitution that you must seek leave to appeal in certain matters. Over time, leave has been granted as a matter of course. But for you, before you appeal, a matter where you have, you have judgment against you, instead of you just having the right to appeal directly, you will first file a motion for leave to appeal. That motion for leave to appeal is pending for five years. For you to just seek a permission to appeal. I mean, why? Why? Do we still allow these antiquarian laws in our constitution? And these are things borrowed from Britain. It's only in exceptional cases they deny you leave to appeal now. Remove all provisions regarding leave to appeal. Let everybody have a right to appeal. Except, of course, the time to appeal, you can seek for extension of time. There should be time limit. But leave to appeal is antiquarian. Remove it from the constitution. Everybody should appeal as a matter of right. And so you can unbundle the Supreme Court with all of this. The congestion of prisons, which is the second day, is that we are not complying with provisions of the law. I want to pay tribute to the 7th Assembly that passed the Admission of Criminal Justice Act. If you look at the provisions of the Admission of Criminal Justice Act, provisions have been made there, adequate provisions, to address the congestions of our cells and our prisons. For instance, every police station in every part of this country should open its cell to the nearest magistrate court at regular intervals for the magistrate to just come and say, open your cell, I want to see who are those you are detaining here and why you are detaining them. The provision is there. The DPOs are supposed to make returns to the magistrates to say, look, we have arrested this person, we are detaining them for this reason, and all and all. They are not complying with those provisions right now. Nobody's complying with those provisions. There are adequate provisions there. But the Administration of Criminal Justice Act is only applicable to federal courts because it's the National Assembly that passed it. Federal courts in Abuja, and all of that. Now, it's only a few states that have adopted the Administration of Criminal Justice Act. I think Kogi and some other states. One or two other states. Now, for states that have not adopted the Administration of Criminal Justice Act, the scandalous situation we see now is that a person is arrested on a frivolous charge, you know, arraigned in court on a supposedly capital offense. Once, once the magistrate court sees murder, armed robbery, even without a proof of evidence attached, they just say remand. We must amend the law and encourage state government, state governments across the country to amend their criminal procedure acts or codes to ensure that at the point the magistrate is entertaining the charge against those accused persons, instead of sending them to remand, the magistrate should have powers to call for proof of evidence at that stage. Don't tell me that you want to take the fight to DPP for advice. I want to see whether you have proof of evidence. If you don't have proof of evidence, even if I see murder, I will release him on bail. If I don't see any proof of evidence attached. Because, with apologies to the police, you, they arrest people on the road. And because you don't have 5,000 for bail, the next day they just type armed robbery and, and take you to court and remand. And the person starts a journey of six years in the prison without bail. That file will be sent to DPP maybe two years later. The person is still waiting. The DPP gets the file, the DPP keeps the file for another four years. It's not attending to the file. Because of our corrupt system. If you've got a corrupt DPP, unless you come and, unless the person has a person, somebody or people to come and push that file, that file will never leave there for him to give his advice when there is no charge, no evidence against that person. And so our prisons are full of these awaiting advice people. They are full. How can we avoid this? Let us give the magistrates power to grant bail in respect of capital, so-called capital offenses, if there's no proof of evidence at that stage. And then, even there, that, that, I've got, that of course, links to the question that my, my very good friend, Dino Malai, asked about the powers of the DPP and the Attorney General that are subject to, can be subject to abuse. I think it is high time we amend the law to make the advice of the Attorney General and DPP subject to judicial review. It's high time. The, the attorney general and the DPP cannot sit down in their office and exercise the judicial function and say you have no case to answer. The, the, the powers were put there to protect, of course, people who will be charged you know, with frivolous offenses. That's why they put the power there, so that the DPP can say don't face trial because it will be frivolous. But on the other hand, 
It is subject to abuse where people who are actually guilty are freed by the DPP by advice. So we should, and to answer Dino Melaya's question, Senator, Distinguished Senator Dino Melaya, that's section 174. Without indicting my very good friend Malami, I know he's a gentleman, he wouldn't withdraw any charge if he did not see the fact that there's no offense there. And I, I, I can vouch for him. If there's any case like that, Malami must have seen that there was no case. I can vouch for Malami in my sleep. He's a, he's a distinguished colleague. But there are other attorneys general across the states who we don't know, who can exercise and abuse this power. And so, if the DPP gives an advice and say, we have you, there's no case against you, let gentlemen, distinguished senators, let us amend the constitution to make that power subject to judicial review. So that the people who are aggrieved can go to court with that advice and call for the proof of evidence. And imagine we say, the attorney general, you are wrong because this case, as I'm saying, there's prima facie case against these people. Charge them to court. We cannot give the attorney generals the power of the judiciary to perform the functions of the judiciary. But let me say that the conditions in section 174 right now, the other scandalous provision there, you put conditions there, but you make them subjective. So, Senator Dimitri is correct to the point that these conditions are put there. But do you, the Supreme Court has ruled in several cases that you cannot question the discretion of the Attorney General. So, the Attorney General says, I have looked at it, and those three conditions have been met. The Supreme Court said, well, it is his discretion. They will not even question that discretion. It is wrong. It's wrong. So, our concern is replete with mistakes antiquarian provisions that we must amend. Um, Chief uh, Kiamu, please I respond to all the questions they raised yes, and then we call on Senator James Manager to make his uh, comments or ask his questions finally. Just quickly, so I don't exhaust the time. As to the restriction of political parties in the country, my, my humble view is that we must strike a balance between opening up the political space, which, we must, which a democracy allows. We must open up the, the political space to everybody strike a balance between that and of course ensuring that frivolous parties do not put frivolous parties do not put pressure on the public purse I, I was the coalition agent for mr president at the last election and by the time they gave us the results sheet it was like a big wrapper like the 74 parties 74 candidates some of them did not even have up to 1000 votes some of them had no votes at all in both parts of the country so how do we allow, and then INEC has to now print ballot papers to accommodate them, the ballot paper, and then that's pressure on the public purse. How do we address this? Distinguished senators, I think we can strike a balance by saying, for new parties to be registered, you must show capacity at some small level first, before you now come and contest for presidency. Register political parties, fine, but you cannot run for president or senate until you go and run for local government election first. Until you win a, a, a councillorship seat, you can reduce it to even one councillorship seat. Until you win a councillorship seat, you cannot run for governorship. Until you win one governorship, you cannot run for senate, and on and on like that. And so you graduate, they, they, they show capacity to begin to graduate. They show capacity at that level. We can strike a balance by passing this kind of laws. To ensure that we all participate in the political process, but we also do not allow all kinds of people to put pressure on the public purse. Now, the questions are also so many. Um, distinguished Senator Okpemi Bamidele, my senior in the struggle, my leader and street senior, my leader, political leader and leader in the struggle also, ask the question as why, how, I, how we handle activism and governance. I think people don't realize that governance is activism. It's just that because over the years, people have seen politicians as corrupt, as inept, and all that. It's wrong. We have distinguished senators here who are fighting for the rights of their people. 
They cannot fight for the rights of the poor without being here. And I said before that, there's only so much you can do as a private person. Being here, distinguished senators, you know what you are doing. You are fighting for consumer protection. You are passing laws on consumer protection. You are passing laws regarding the rights of the people and how to give them succor. That is activism. Activism is not... I mean, we, are, we have great activists here as senators. I, agree. I mean, that is the truth. Activism is not when you just buy one Android phone and begin to abuse everybody every day. That's not activism. Activism is not when you begin to burn down vehicles and, and march. On. That's not activism. Activism is how to bring... You, are, say you, are, you say you are an activist and you are burning the cars of innocent people on the road. How are you bringing soccer to them? Are those cars belonging to the president that you want to quarrel against? That's stupidity. Apologize. The greatest activists are those in governance. And the greatest activists are people in the legislature. In governance. That is how. Mr. President, two more minutes. Two more minutes. And, and quickly as to my philosophy, my philosophy of life, I want to put it very simple, in simple language. I don't want to die without making a loud statement for society and for the poor and the downtrodden. I don't want to die. And that is why I have been, I have been, I have been restless since I was called to the bar. And I'm sure you know that I eventually grew up in front of the nation. Everybody saw me since I was in my, my 20s. I'm almost 50 now. But every single year, I have been restless in fighting for one thing or the other. And everybody watched me grow. The man standing out here, standing here, is that restless young lawyer you used to do many years ago that has grown to become a senior advocate of Nigeria standing here before you. So I grew up before your eyes, virtually. And so I have been restless because I don't want to die without making a loud statement. Time up, Mr. President. And for this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Distinguished Senator Manager, please. Distinguished Senator Manager. Which question hasn't he answered? No, you answer. Yeah. Two minutes, yes. Thank you very much. I, 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 was, I was brimming to answer that question, actually, because I didn't want to leave here without answering that question. On the Code of Conduct and its provisions, and, you know, vis-a-vis, the powers, the so-called powers, like you put it, of the presidential panel on recovery of proper property. There's a problem. The problem is that you allow the law to remain in your books. That law was passed in 1984. The law regarding recovery of public property. It was a decree. And when we now, I'll finish. I'll tie it in. And when we now transited to civil rule, they said all those laws that become acts of parliament. And so that law says the president has powers to set up any panel to recover public property. Let me tell you the difference. Let me tell you the difference. The code of conduct is a constitution. Is a constitution did not, no, hold on, sir, with respect, sir, did not criminalize, did not criminalize those provisions regarding the code of conduct. It is that act that now makes it criminal offense. That's the difference. So it's not in conflict. The code of conduct, they will only ban you from public office, ban you from, they will not send you to jail. But that act now makes it a criminal offense. So, I am also the lead prosecutor to the panel at some point. I'm the lead prosecutor. And then the Court of Appeal has actually curtailed the powers now. There's a judgment that the Court of Appeal says you cannot charge anybody to court. You can only investigate. And pass your investigation over to the Attorney General for the Attorney General to make a choice. So there's a Court of Appeal judgment. Anything beyond that is abuse of power. Anything beyond that is abuse of power. Is it? You saw the distinguished, distinguished colleagues, please. I did yes. that case. It's my case at the court of appeal. I did that case. Mr. Nomini, yes, I think you have answered enough uh, on that. The distinguished Senator James Eboy, manager. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President, seated as uh, chair. Uh, the Deputy Senior President, my highly respected colleagues, James Manager Delta South. 
Mr. President, you can see how excited I am. Yes. You have a good product. Really? Of course, I am. <laughs> For obvious reasons. Good product. And you know the reasons why. And see, you see me bouncing. Because that is what Delta is all about. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, the irrepressible Festus Kayam, <laughs> Lenin sick. I said it all. And he has given good account of his personality, of what he stands for, and of course of, for what he represents. Mr. President, my highly respected colleagues, the Delta Caucus of course, led by the able Deputy Senate President. He has mandated me to speak on behalf of the caucus. The Deputy Senate President, O.V. Omangiki, distinguished senator. The senator representing Delta North, another lawyer. <laughs> All, right. All the three senators from Delta State are lawyers, and also very senior at the bar. <laughs> Mr. President, we have come to the agreement and we speak for the entire Delta State. And between yesterday and today, we have consulted very widely. And the entire Delta State is behind this nominee. Mr. President, my highly respected colleagues, he has told us about who he is. He has used the instrumentality of the law to fight for social justice. He has used the jurisprudence of the law to ask questions about the law as it is and the law as it ought to be. Mr. President, he has said it all. And of course, Mr. President, first Kiamu is from Delta States, a proud constituent of the Deputy Senate President. And of course, this is very significant. Delta and Ogun, forget my mouth. Delta and Ogun State. Mr. President, my highly respected colleagues, to avoid wasting your time, because it's like the entire Senate is together, that this, senator must take, this nominee must take his bow and go. He, the Deputy Senate President represents him, and that is very significant, my respected colleagues. So, Mr. President, I hereby say that let the senior advocate of Nigeria, and when, after listening to him, it is very obvious that we need to separate the office of the Antony General from the office of the Honorable the Minister of Justice. Uh, Mr. President, I move that let the nominee take his bow and go. Thank you, Mr. President, for the opportunity. Well, thank you very much, uh, the Sungush colleagues. I can see Delta is in contention with Oyo. No, 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 no. What I'm saying, the joke is Oyo state yesterday, the caucus presented their nominee and they started by asking him questions themselves. And the nominee did extremely well. That was the judgment. Delta is in contention, isn't it? Yes. Distinguished colleagues, I can see the mood is that Faustus Kiamo, senior advocate of Nigeria, takes a bow and go. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say nay. The ayes have it. Thank you for commenting on our videos. Please keep commenting. If you've not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do so for regular updates. Keep watching Juvenis and keep buying Juvenis. Juvenis is published bi monthly by Binox Communications Limited. For inquiries, event coverage, or advert placement, call 
0805-387-1199-0702-811-3638 or 0808-152-4499 or visit www.juvenis.punax.net Juvenis Magazine Inspiring the young at heart